Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom, here on WHFS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. I'd like to take some time to talk a little bit about the Confederacy and the Confederate flag. There's been a lot of controversy about the Confederate flag lately. People have been demanding that it be banned from the country, that it be taken down from uh, South Carolina's Capitol building and anywhere else that it's flown around the country. Um, Apple, the computer company, actually went so far as to ban the Confederate flag from any applications that were in its uh, app store, the download store that it has. Uh, I believe Mattel or some other toy company has decided it's no longer going to pr print the Confederate flag on some of its toys. And so there's been a, a huge backlash against this flag in this country. And a lot of that anger is coming from the people who are outraged at the recent tragedy in South Carolina with the church and the nine uh, black people who were killed by the one white person who was claimed to have worshipped the Confederate flag and he was a racist and all of this stuff. And a lot of people think that this flag stands for racism and stands for slavery. And so I'd like to, on this show today, go back in time and talk a little bit about the Confederacy and the Southern nations back during that time period and uh, explain a little bit about why that flag did not mean slavery and racism and instead meant uh, freedom from tyranny and freedom from what the South saw was a malicious tax system that was meant to uh, hurt them uh, and benefit the Northern uh, states and Northern um, union and federal government that was taking that money uh, through tariffs and through taxes from the South. So the first article I would like to read is by Thomas DiLorenzo, and it's called Lincoln's Greatest Failure, or How a Real Statesman Would Have Ended Slavery. Quote, every other country in the world got rid of slavery without a civil war. How much would that cost compared to killing 600,000 Americans when the hatred lingered for 100 years? Ron Paul to Tim Russert on Meet the Press in 2007. The new Steven Spielberg movie about Lincoln is entirely based on a fiction, to use a mild term. As longtime Ebony Magazine executive editor Lerone Bennett Jr. explained in his book, Forced into Glory, Abraham Lincoln's White Dream, quote, there is a pleasant fiction that Lincoln became a flaming advocate of the 13th Amendment and used the power of his office to buy votes to ensure its passage. There is no evidence, as David H. Donald has noted, to support that fiction. In fact, as Bennett shows, it was the genuine abolitionists in Congress who forced Lincoln to support the 13th Amendment that ended slavery, something he refused to do for 54 of his 56 years. The, t the truth, in other words, is precisely the opposite of the story told in Spielberg's Lincoln movie, which is based on the book Team of Rivals by the confessed plagiarist-slash-court historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. And who is David H. Donald, cited by Bennett as his authority? He is a longtime Harvard University historian, Pulitzer Prize-winning Lincoln biographer, and the preeminent mainstream Lincoln scholar of our time. One would think that Goodwin would have considered his work being a Harvard graduate herself. The theme of the Spielberg movie is the subtitle of Goodwin's book, quote, The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln. Nothing gets a leftist legs tingling more than someone who is very, very good at the methods of political theft, plunder, subterfuge, and bullying. Goodwin, the court historian, has devoted her life to writing hagiographies of the worst of the worst political bullies, FDR, Lyndon Johnson, the Kennedys, and Lincoln. It was her book on the Kennedys that got her in trouble and forced her to admit plagiarizing dozens of paragraphs and paying a six-figure sum to the victim of her plagiarism. That got her kicked off the Pulitzer Prize Committee and PBS, but only for a very short while. Lincoln's political genius is grossly overblown in Goodwin's book. In addition, the book, like virtually all other books on the subject, completely misses the point. 
If Lincoln was such a political genius, he should have used his genius to end slavery in the way the British, French, Spaniards, Dutch, Danes, Swedes, and all the northern states in the U.S. did in the 19th century, namely, peacefully. Instead, the slaves were used as political pawns in a war that resulted in the death of some 800,000 Americans according to the latest revised estimates of Civil War deaths that has come to be accepted by the history profession. To this number should be added tens of thousands of Southern civilians. Standardizing for today's population, that would be the equivalent of more than 8 million dead Americans, with more than double that number maimed for life. Lincoln, the political genius, thanked his naval commander Gustavus Fox for helping him maneuver slash trick the Confederates into firing on Fort Stumpter, where no one was hurt, let alone killed. This, Lincoln believed, gave him the right to ignore the constitutional definition of treason as levying war upon the states and levy war upon the southern states in order to prove, once and for all, that the American Union was not voluntary and not based on the principle of the consent of the governed, as Jefferson declared in the Declaration of Independence. The main purpose of the war was to destroy the Jeffersonian states' rights vision of government and replace it with the Hamiltonian vision of a highly centralized, dictatorial, executive state that would pursue a domestic policy of mercantilism, the Federalist Whig Republican Party platform of protectionist tariffs, corporate welfare, and a national bank to finance it all and a foreign policy of empire and imperialism. The purpose and the result of the war was to consolidate all political power in Washington, D.C., and to render all states, north and south, as mere appendages for their masters and overseers in Washington. This, of course, is exactly what happened after the war, and it happened by design, not coincidence. A real statesman, as opposed to a monstrous, egomaniacal, patronage politician like Abe Lincoln, would have made use of the decades-long world history of peaceful emancipation if his main purpose was to end slavery. Of course, Lincoln always insisted that that was in no way his purpose. He stated this very clearly in his first inaugural address, in which he even supported the proposed Corwin Amendment to the Constitution, which would have prohibited the federal government from ever interfering with Southern slavery. He and the U.S. Congress declared repeatedly that the purpose of the war was to, quote, save the Union, but of course the war destroyed the voluntary Union of the Founding Fathers. Jim Powell's book, Greatest Emancipations, How the West Ended Slavery, provides chapter and verse of how real statesmen of the world, in sharp contrast to Lincoln, ended slavery without resorting to waging total war on their own citizens. Among the tactics employed by the British, French, Spanish, Dutch, Danes, and others were slave rebellions, abolitionist campaigns to gain public support for emancipation, election of anti-slavery politicians, encouragement and assistance of runaway slaves, raising private funds to purchase the freedom of slaves, and the use of tax dollars to buy the freedom of slaves. There were some incidents of violence, but nothing remotely approaching the violence of a war that ended up killing 800,000 Americans. The story of how Great Britain ended slavery peacefully is the highlight of Powell's book. There were once as many as 15,000 slaves in English herself, along with hundreds of thousands throughout the British Empire. The British abolitionists combined religion, politics, publicity campaigns, legislation, and the legal system to end slavery there just two decades prior to the American Civil War. Great credit is given to the British statesman and member of the House of Commons, William Wilberforce. After organizing an educational campaign to convince British society that slavery was immoral and barbaric, Wilberforce succeeded in getting a Slavery Abolition Act passed in 1833, and within seven years some 800,000 slaves were freed. Tax dollars were used to purchase the freedom of the slaves, which eliminated the only source of opposition to emancipation, wealthy slave owners. 
it was expensive. But as Powell notes, nothing in the world is more expensive than war. Powell also writes how there was tremendous opposition to ending slavery in the northern states, in the U.S., especially Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island, where violent mobs wrecked abolitionist printing presses. A New Hampshire school that educated black children was dragged into a swamp by oxen. Free blacks were prohibited from residing in Illinois, Iowa, Indiana, and Oregon. Abolitionist agitators in northern states were whipped, and orphanages for black children were burned to the ground in Pennsylvania. Nevertheless, northern state abolitionists persevered and ended slavery there peacefully. There were no violent and enormously destructive wars of emancipation in New York or New England. Cuba, Brazil, and the Congo also ended slavery peacefully in the 19th century by real statesmen in those countries, but not in the United States. Some people have objected that the United States couldn't have bought the freedom of all the slaves because that would have cost too much, Powell writes. Quote, but buying the freedom of the slaves was not more expensive than war. Nothing is more costly than war. In fact, the North's financial costs of war alone would have been enough to purchase the freedom of all the slaves, and then ended slavery legally and constitutionally. It is a myth that Lincoln toiled mightily in his last days to get a reluctant Congress to pass the 13th Amendment, as portrayed in the Spielberg movie. What he did spend his time on was micromanaging the waging of total war on southern civilians, who he always considered to be American citizens, since he denied the legitimacy of secession. More importantly, as documented by historian Philip Magnus and Sebastian Page in their book Colonization After Emancipation, Lincoln spent many long days at the end of his life communicating with foreign governments and plotting with William Seward, among others, to colonize all of the Africans, as he called them, out of the United States once the war was over. That article is by Thomas DiLorenzo. It was called Lincoln's Greatest Failure, or How a Real Statesman Would Have Ended Slavery. And it was posted on lewrockwell.com. So that article was just a little bit of the history of Lincoln and the seceding southern states and why the flag that they were flying does not actually stand for racism and slavery since that was never Lincoln's intention in fighting the war against the South. Uh, His intention was to, quote, save the Union. And he wanted to impose the federal government on the uh, states who did not want that federal government anymore. And that was really his intention. So, So Slavery and racism really had very little to do with the decision for both parties to enter into the war. And we can tell that because we know that there's, there was only about 3% of the population at the time who actually owned slaves. So for one out of every four of military fighting age males to die in a conflict, the, the South lost one out of every four of their males, 25% of their population in the fight against the North, uh, to defend 3% of the population is a little outlandish. And so, again, slavery was a very small part of this conflict, and uh, I think that's very not talked about in the media and in society today, especially with all of the talk about the Confederate flag recently. So the next article I would like to delve into is also by Thomas DiLorenzo, and it talks about the real reason for the anti-Confederate flag hysteria, offering some explanation as to why this is so uh, prominent in our media, and uh, especially given that the flag doesn't really have much to do with racism or or slavery, uh, even if that's the contrived understanding that a lot of people have about that flag. So uh, he starts out and says... Every couple of years, the totalitarian socialist left in America, a.k.a. the Democratic Party in all of its appendages, pretends to be indignant about the existence of the Confederate flag somewhere. The lapdog cultural Marxist media fall in line, treating the sighting of the flag in the same way they would treat the sighting of an Ebola victim in a large crowd. 
Americans are reminded once again by the New York, New England, Ivy League educated prostitute class that they should hate Southerners in all things Southern. As Comedy Central's Jon Stewart recently whined in far horror, Southerners, quote, waged war against the United States government. The anti-Confederate flag hysteria is only one small part of the left's general strategy, however. It is part of their overriding strategy of diverting the public's attention away from all the grotesque failures of leftist interventionism, from the welfare state to the government takeover of education to the war on drugs and beyond. The neocons who run the Republican Party are usually complicit in all of this. The welfare state has decimated the black family and is hard at work destroying the white family as well by eliminating the stigma against a man's abandoning his wife and children with welfare checks. What does the Confederate flag have to do with this? The welfare state has destroyed the work ethic of millions of Americans. What does the Confederate flag have to do with this? The Fed caused the biggest depression since the Great Depression with its latest boom and bust cycle act. What does the Confederate flag have to do with this? The rotten inner city government schools have enriched uneducated teachers and school bureaucrats but have ruined the lives of untold numbers of black children with fraudulent education. What does the Confederate flag have to do with this? The war on drugs has had a horrific racial effect in that it has caused the incarceration of hundreds of thousands of mostly young black men from the inner cities while creating the reasons for drug gang violence and all the death that is associated with it. What does the Confederate flag have to do with this? The minimum wage law has always had a disproportionately harmful effect on black teenage unemployment. What does the Confederate flag have to do with this? High taxes, onerous regulations, and uncontrollable government spending by all levels of government have sucked resources out of the job-creating private sector only to fatten the government bureaucracy, depriving all Americans of job opportunities. What has the Confederate flag have to do with any of this? All of this was done under the auspices of the U.S. flag. The ideological linchpin of the cultural Marxists who dominate so much of American politics, the media, and the universities, is the argument that there is one and only one reason why there still exists a black underclass, mostly in American cities, namely white privilege and the legacy of slavery. To cultural Marxists, nothing else matters or should even be allowed to be discussed. The welfare warfare state, the war on drugs, the public schools, etc., cannot possibly have had anything but good effects, they say, because they were all undertaken with the best of intentions. It's all the fault of white privilege, say privileged white politicians, privileged white university administrators, and privileged white media talking heads. The Confederate flag, they claim, is the banner of white privilege, the sole cause of all the problems of the underclass, hence all the extreme torches and pitchforks type behavior over the flag in recent days. The cultural Marxist left views it all as an assault on white privilege, the source of all evil in the world. Another defining characteristic of the cultural Marxist left is its hatred of free speech by those who disagree with it. Free speech should only be enjoyed by the victims of white, heterosexual male oppression, they say. Allowing white male oppressors to have free speech simply leads to even more oppression of the oppressed, which now includes everyone who is not a white, heterosexual male. That is why so many university administrators proudly crack down on academic freedom with campus speech codes, tolerance of riotous disruptions or of conservative or libertarian campus lecturers, and even the libeling and slandering of such speakers when they are allowed to speak. It makes them popular among the cultural Marxist faculty in the humanities and social sciences, and therefore makes their jobs and lives more pleasant. It also helps to cement into place the cultural Marxist mantra that white privilege is the one and only source of all the world's problems. 
That article was called The Real Reason for the Anti-Confederate Flag Hysteria, and it was by Thomas DiLorenzo, and you can read it at lewrockwell.com. So the last article I would like to read to you talks a little bit about secession and uh, what's going on in Europe and how people are seceding or attempting to secede from governments over there. So the early American colonists in the 13 colonies, original colonies, back in the 1700s, seceded from Britain and were successful in doing so. They created their own country and they disbanded the political uh, control that Britain had over the U.S. states and said, now we're going to go our own way. And of course, Britain attacked them and they were able to successfully defend themselves from Britain. Fast forward about 100 years and we see in 1861, Lincoln attacked the uh, seceding colonies the same way that Britain attacked the seceding colonies uh, only 100 years earlier from that. And uh, Lincoln was successful in attacking and destroying the insurrection, the rebellion, uh, against the federal government. And so one of them is always viewed as good, the American Revolution, where they seceded from Britain. And the other one is always seen as bad. The Southerners tried to secede from the federal government. But I would claim that they are exactly the same thing. They are secession. They are self-determination and secession. And so Ryan McMacken is going to talk a little bit about this on his article that he wrote uh, for Mises.org. The secessionist impulse doesn't seem to be going away in Europe. This month, the Wall Street Journal reported that the latest drive for secession comes from Sardinia. The leaders of the movement proposed that the island, only part of Italy since the 1860s, be joined to Switzerland instead. The Sardinians have a tough row to hoe in convincing the Swiss to accept them as the newest Swiss Swiss canton. But the whole episode illustrates yet again that the national borders drawn on the map over the past two centuries are beginning to outlive their usefulness. As with the Venetians, the Scots, and the Catalonians, the matter of Sardinian secession and or annexation involves any number of referenda and discussions about self-determination. And in this case, as with most similar cases, one is left with the problem of determining how one can morally go about switching state affiliations without precipitating war or accusations of human rights abuses. The Europeans don't phrase it this way, but when they discuss the need for plebiscites and democracy, this is what they mean. Certainly, this problem was not at all alien to the laissez-faire liberals of the 19th century, including Ludwig von Mises, who wrote, quote, No people and no part of a people shall be held against its will in a political association that it does not want. Mises then went on to defend, quote, the right of the inhabitants of every territory to decide on the state that, to which they wish to belong. On a purely technical level, it is easy to imagine this sort of territorial plebiscitary process. The problem one is left with in, the, in these cases, however, is what to do with the minorities that oppose the secession or annexation by other states. This is the claim made by nationalists who oppose secession by Catalonia, for example. The nationalists assert that even if a majority were to prefer independence, minorities within Catalonia itself would be disenfranchised by secession. The nationalist solutions in this scenario, therefore, is to disenfranchise the majority. But this solution is nothing more than an appeal to the central government to unilaterally settle this problem with force. In contrast, the proper solution lies not in centralization, but in further breaking down the size of each territory into smaller pieces to account for demographic realities and minority populations within the regions themselves. But if any community, no matter how small, can simply break off and join another state or remain independent, what's to stop single households from doing this? Rothbard asked this same question, and it brings us back to Mises' comments on self-determination. Mises writes, quote, If it were any way possible to grant this right of self-determination to every individual person, it would have to be done. 
This is impracticable only because of compelling technical considerations which make it necessary that the right of self-determination be restricted to the will of the majority of the inhabitants of areas large enough to count as territorial units in the administration of the country. In other words, anarchism is theoretically justifiable, although technically problematic. Nevertheless, from a sociological and economic standpoint, Mises' concerns about there being a practical floor to the extent to which states can be broken up appears to be useful. After all, there is no denying that people like to join together in groups for a variety of purposes not limited to military and economic ends. The megastates of the modern world are held together by coercion, but cities, towns, and communities are naturally occurring phenomena that predate states. Moreover, just as I give up the freedom to talk loudly or adjust the volume when I watch a movie at a theater instead of my home, virtually everyone, even in a system of theoretically limitless secession, would give up at least some of his own personal prerogatives in the name of joining a municipality, league, or association that could provide legal and defense services. At the same time, individuals would be careful to keep the majority of power at the local level, since individuals can still exercise influence over localized governments. But this raises a new question. If people choose to give up certain prerogatives to join with others in cities and towns, isn't this true of all states? Haven't people voluntarily chosen to be part of Russia or part of the United States? The answer here is no, because without a meaningful ability to make choices or provide a new choice via secession, no truly voluntary choice has been made. As I've noted here, states erect legal and practical barriers to extend their monopoly powers over a large area and over many facets of life in order to diminish choices and options. Likewise, states generally prohibit the creation of new states so as to further strengthen their monopolies. So the extent to which one is voluntarily subject to a civil government moving along a sliding scale. At one end of the scale is a one-world megastate where no choice is possible at all. At the other end of the scale is a totally stateless society. Most, if not all, of human history has been characterized by civil governments that fall somewhere in between. Some civil governments are very large and very coercive. That is, they are quintessential states. Some governments are very small and very decentralized and are much less state-like. These later governments must compete with numerous nearby options for citizens and capital. Naturally, a world with fewer states and very centralized states offer few options, which in turn means fewer choices for persons, cities, towns, and communities. In spite of this, we still sometimes encounter the bizarre argument that secession is bad because secession creates a new state. But just as consumers of pizza benefit when a new Pizza Hut opens down the street to compete with Domino's Pizza, consumers of defense services and legal systems benefit when a new competitor becomes available in their neighborhood of states. If Domino's Pizza managed to use force to prevent any other pizza chain from opening up in town, this would clearly be a bad thing. Likewise, when a state uses force to prevent the creation of a new state or prevent the movement of a region from one state to another, we can see this is undesirable because it limits choice, freedom, innovation, and all the good things we associate with a lack of monopoly power. So that article was by Ryan McMacken. It was called Self-Determination and Secession, and you can read it online at mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot org. So thank you very much for tuning into my show. This has been a presentation of the Austrian Circle here on WHOS Stores, 91.7 FM. Tune in for uh, another episode next week and all sorts of other great programming on this station. Have a great week. Take care.